All right, you are listening to the Maker's Quest podcast. I'm Brian Benham. And I am Greg Porter. And today we are talking about making it work with what you've got. Sometimes uh, we don't have what we need, <laughs> but we got to make it work. And I, I think every maker out there, every designer out there has been in that situation before where you might have an ideal set of materials or an ideal set of tools to do task X. And you're stuck in a situation where you don't have those things. So you've got to somehow patch something together that works. And I'm guessing, Brian, you've probably been in that situation more than once. Uh, yeah, quite quite often, actually. Uh, and I think uh, I've had some really close calls with trying to push that uh, too far where I've almost gotten hurt. <laughs> quite, uh, quite a few years ago, back before... Uh, I had my bandsaw and and my shop's probably a lot like most everybody else's shop when we're first starting out. We don't have all the tools in the world. There's no tool fairy that comes in and sprinkles tools around our shop while we're sleeping. So I had to build up my my tools over time and I had, didn't have a bandsaw yet. And it was coming up on Christmas time and I wanted to make some Christmas ornaments on the lathe and I wanted them to be like a segmented turning kind of a thing. So I glued up all these little pieces and uh, I wanted to square it up at somehow so it, it would be easier and like bevel it or something like you make it into an octagon so it's easier to get started and turning on the lathe. And I didn't have a bandsaw and I thought to myself, well, I could take it easy on the table saw and it's just this little short, you know, three or four inch thing and it's kind of wobbly, but I thought push stick and just going nice and slow, I'll be able to get one side flat and then just start rotating it around to make it an octagon. And just as it was completing its first cut, it tilted just a little bit, uh, rocked just a little bit on its uneven surface and caught the back of the blade and turned it into a missile and flew back, hit me in the safety glasses. It broke my safety glasses, uh, cut the side of my forehead as it veered off. And then I could hear it bouncing around behind me. I'm not exactly sure what exactly happened after it hit me in the face. Uh, I was doing that uh, check, okay, hands are okay, but I know I'm hurt, kind of a check, and I'm bleeding off my side of my face. And uh, it was just one of those things that uh, was, uh, I probably should have stopped and thought of a better way, but I didn't have the tool that I thought I needed to make it work. So I was making it work with something else. It probably went by your head like a Nolan Ryan fastball. If I had to guess, <laughs> yeah, it, was, it, it was just a split second. It happened so fast. That's and I don't want to get too far off topic here, but uh, I think you and I both use Delta Unisaws. We don't use the fancy saw stops. And I think there's a, a hidden fallacy there that people think the saw stop is going to help all of their table saw accidents. And quite honestly, the table saw accidents that I've had in my life, the saw stop would have done nothing to, to save them. And that sounds like a prime example of yeah, exactly that. Kickback is not, uh, is not going to stop you uh, from getting hurt uh, if you don't contact the blade. And, and uh, as you know, with your Unisaw, it probably doesn't have a riving knife because uh, it's probably that was back made back in the day before they thought about those kind of things or, or someone cornered the market on riving knives and Delta wasn't able to put it in their saw or something. <laughs> well, mine has uh, mine has the attachment for, uh, what is it, the blade guard that had a riving knife in, in the guard. But someone who owned the saw well before me took that off and threw it in the trash. <laughs> so I've never had it. And I've I've actually gone in and looked at how that's attached and could I put one on? And when I started looking at all the inserts and everything else that I would have to modify or change or, or add to my arsenal, it was like, well, you know what, how about this? Uh, be careful <laughs> and don't do stupid things like that. And I know sometimes it, as careful as you are, you can't avoid some of those things, but um, this talk isn't about table shop, table saw safety, but man, it can surely go there in a hurry. Can it? Yeah, before we uh before we move on, one one thing I think we should have mentioned about table saw safety and kickback is that if your table saw doesn't have a riving knife that you can make a slit in your uh zero clearance uh insert and glue a piece of wood in there in line with the blade that'll help prevent kickback. 
Um, and I've, I've done that since that accident, but that wood was piece of wood was so small. I don't think it would have helped. I think it still would have caught the back edge of the blade, but yeah, I think, I think I'm with you there. There's an old saying when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail and, yeah. um, really my first power tool, I shouldn't say that my first power tool was probably a drill press or something along those lines, but for cutting wood, my first power tool was a table saw as well. And that became my uh, Swiss army knife, if you will, just doing different things on the table saw that might be a little more unconventional. And to this day, I think people see me use the table saw and sometimes try to, you know, pull back, but all of those moves come with an insane amount of experience with that tool and understanding where those danger zones are and how you actually can use it safely to do a number of different things. There was, I take that back. The first power tool was a radial arm saw that my grandfather had and, you know, wound up uh, in my dad's shop. And so when I was a young man, we didn't have a table saw. We had the radial arm saw, which is probably 10 times more dangerous than the table saw. If you're trying to do things outside of cross cutting, I used it for dado cuts. I used it for ripping. I used it for uh, doing all kinds of bevel cuts, compound miters, you name it. And some of those things very safe. Um, but when you lock that blade, turn it 90 degrees and start feeding things in the direction that the blade is spinning, it starts to get a little dicey <laughs> to <laughs> say the least. But, but yeah, the, so I guess back to, back to making it work. That was probably, uh, no, from the time, I, I don't even think I was a teenager yet when I started doing woodwork in my dad's shop and probably from, from maybe 11, 12 years old, somewhere in that general vicinity to somewhere in my twenties where I got my first table saw and man, that radial arm saw was everything, you know, that was the make it work tool. And if, uh, between the table saw and a hand or sorry, the radial arm saw a hand rasp and some chisels, I felt like I could make almost anything. I look back now and it's like, man, how did I make some of the things that I did make, uh, make it work on that, on that tool. But you look at it and, and uh, I think, you know, rewind the clock a hundred years, they didn't have the the power tools that we have now, and they could make things that would make our, our jaws drop. That's for certain. And to a level of precision that most people now just don't ever experience. Yeah. I think uh, starting out without having a whole bunch of tools is, is going to make you a better craftsman uh, and probably a better problem solver too. If you don't mm -hmm. have the tool, you can't make it work or you have to figure out how to make it work without that tool. You just don't want to push the limits to where you get hurt. But uh, uh, another uh, story about hurting myself when I was a kid, <laughs> my dad had a radio arm saw and that was what I started my woodworking journey on. And he also had a router uh, and those were kind of the two main tools I gravitated uh, to. But my mom had this rule that I could not use any of the power tools until my dad got home from work. Like he had to supervise it. She didn't want anything to do with any kind of blood or accidents or anything like that. And I was a big fan of uh, Roy Underhill with the Woodwright shop on PBS and he was all hand tools. So I was like, okay, my dad also has a whole bunch of chisels and hand planes and all that. And I wanted to cut a dado in a board, but he didn't have the right uh, hand plane to cut dados in the board. So I thought, well, I'll cut it with a chisel. And uh, I slipped and ran that chisel right between the my thumb and finger and sliced all the way to the bone. Ooh. So that was really my first trip to the emergency room as a maker. And uh, of course, it happened while my mom was home and I wasn't using power tools. And so my mom had the pleasure of driving me to the emergency room to get six stitches in my, in my, the crook of my thumb. Oh man. Well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm sure you were probably in the same place I was when I was young. Uh, and I think a lot of those lessons that we learn, you know, as kids using dad's tools and, you know, you, you, you got to touch the burner sometimes and get burnt to understand how dangerous something is. But, uh, 
I can I can remember the chisels that I would use would were just completely rounded off. There was no sharpness left in them. So you were just banging on them, trying to get them to cut through whatever it was that you were trying to cut through or that I was trying to cut through. And in in my uh, older, wiser years, I've realized that sometimes the most dangerous tool isn't the sharp one, it's the dull one. And <laughs> I somehow made it through my teenage years and early 20s using dull tools all the time. You know, uh, we had one whetstone that was probably a coarse grit whetstone, and that was what I sharpened everything on. And that was as sharp as they got was you know, somewhere around 36 grit or something like that. And that is, that is definitely uh, not a safe thing to do, but as a, as a young kid, that's what you have to do. You got to use what you got. And again, you know, uh, gosh, I was in bands growing up and we couldn't afford to buy big speaker cabinets and things. So I would buy raw components and build the cabinets and, you know, it's just pine boards and things like that. But putting them together in sealed boxes that were nice and square again with a radial arm saw and some chisels. And I used a lot of dowels for alignment and things like that, but uh, it was kind of amazing. And with that limited a number of tools, what I was able to accomplish. And I would even start to flip that into some of the metal working that I started doing. Um, I started doing sheet metal work I'm going to say it was my freshman year of college. So I was probably 18 years old and you're talking about forming panels for cars and everything else. Right. And a hammer and dolly, you know, I, I say a hammer, it, it was probably four or five different size hammers and a few steel dollies and then some tree stump type material. And you can make anything with those tools. And I'm the guy who's also had an English wheel. I don't have it anymore. I, I sold it when I moved, but I had an English wheel. I've got um, planishing hammers and everything else. And those tools are very nice. You can do a lot with them very quickly. Uh, shrinker stretchers, those types of things. But with with just simple hand tools, you can make almost any shape that you want to make. It just takes a little time. Yeah, I, I think I credit uh, a lot of my success to the fact that when I started, I didn't have a lot of tools. And so I had to figure out how to make it work with the tools that I had, especially like a hand tools. Uh, chisels were, you know, relatively inexpensive at Woodcraft. You can still get a, a better chisel than you can get at a, a Home Depot and Japanese mm -hmm. pole saws I use to this day. And they're, when I got first got started, I think they were only like 20 bucks or something for a a pole saw now I think they're like 60 or 70 but still that's pretty cheap compared to like a $300 Lee Nielsen handsaw but uh being forced to figure out how to use it uh really like kind of honed my my skills in and I think that's kind of something that is lost in today's world if someone has a lot of money and they go out and buy the Festool Domino which is the easiest way to make a mortise and tenon and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that I have one and it's fantastic but uh, if I started with a Festool Domino, I don't think I would have the fundamentals down that I have today to help me with more complex projects. I think I've talked about it before. I'm not sure uh, if it was on our podcast here or not, but one of my architecture professors showed us a movie called The Japanese Carpenter, and it talked about that uh, the uh, apprenticeship that the Japanese carpenters have, and essentially they spend their first year sharpening tools. And they don't get to do any real woodwork. They they get to sharpen tools. And it it always reinforces to me how important it is to have those fundamentals so that if you, uh-oh, you've got a bug in your room. Oh, no, I was looking. Uh, there's a book oh. that you reminded me of. Um, oh. But you're telling me, go on with your story and I'm going to grab oh. this book. Sure, sure. Um, but But the fact that they sharpen tools for an entire year that builds a skill and a um, discipline that throughout your entire career, if you have a tool that's not sharp, you have the discipline to stop and sharpen it because you did that for an entire year. And the five minutes that it's going to take you to touch up your chisel or your plane blade is nothing compared to that year that you spent 2000 hours sharpening those same blades. And I think when we're talking about making it work and, and all those kind of things, it's it's amazing how few tools you need if they're tuned up very well. 
and um you know uh, real life stuff right uh i shared with you before we hit the record button i got my carmen Ghia down off the lift and started driving it a couple of weeks ago and uh it i've always said when i drive that car and i arrive somewhere i'm the happiest guy in the room because i actually got there and i was meeting somebody for coffee the other morning and I was like, you know, it's a nice day. We're taking the Gia to work, right? So away we go. I get caught in some construction. The Gia starts acting funny. I pull over and it dies. And I'm like, oh God. And I usually carry 400 pounds of tools in the front end of that car, just in case something happens, I have the tool to fix it. And of course I pop open, I had a really small toolbox. And literally the only tool that I had in there was a six millimeter wrench that I didn't need. And I, I had a set of vice grips and I thought, well, here we go. The vice grip challenge. What can I do with a pair of vice grips? And uh, it's not stripping the head of the bolt off. Yeah. And, you know, these are uh, in most cases, old, you know, 50 year old German parts that are really difficult to replace with the right parts. You can get replacement parts, but the right parts. Anyway, I, I had to go back. I had a throttle cable that had come loose. And uh, I also had the line from my ignition coil to my distributor somehow had shaken loose and that was what caused it to die. But the, the accelerator uh, cable had come loose as well. So anyway, that, that pair of vice grips got me out of that jam and I thought, all right, <laughs> you know, we're good. I'm covered in grease and oil, but uh, we're good. We're going to make it <laughs> to my, my coffee appointment. But Again, just making it work with what you got. I think there's definitely, it, it's a mindset. It's um, it's almost like when you, if you've ever watched one of the challenges that, that golfers do all the time is they play around a golf and every hole, they have to give up a club or something along those lines. And, you know, they wound up, wind up playing entire holes with like a nine iron or something like that. And um it, I, I always feel like that's such a great exercise as a woodworker or anything else. You know, if, if what you really need is over your shoulder or out of reach, deal with what you've, you've got in front of you and see if you can make it work. And, and it's amazing. Um, if you slow down and use, use your skills and your knowledge, you can accomplish just about anything with almost any set of tools. Yeah, so uh, that reminds me of uh, Colonel Chris Hatfield. He is a, uh, a NASA astronaut, has been to space several times, and one of the things that is part of their training is you're in space, so you can't just stop and, and uh, go look something up on Google when you're out doing a spacewalk or whatever. So you have to, uh, you have to work the problem until you solve it or you die. That's basically your... <laughs> Your two options, you 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 could either, you have a problem, you're either going to die or you're going to have to figure it out and you have to figure it out with what you have on your spacewalker on that space station. Yeah. Yeah. No pressure there. I guess, you know, our Apollo 13 astronauts are living proof, right? Of the, yeah, that, that exactly. You just, you just got to keep moving forward until you can't move forward anymore. And thankfully they, they all return to earth, which by the way, if anybody ever has the opportunity or finds themselves in the middle of Kansas, there's the Kansas Cosmosphere and Space Center in Hutchison, Kansas, and they have the Apollo 13 capsule there on display. And it looks like a crispy burnt Triscuit on the outside. So really a fascinating thing to see in person when, when you see that capsule sitting there, how small it is and how burnt it is you realize how close those guys were to not making it back. So just a, sorry, total sidebar no, there, that's, but, that's but it's a testament good. to the, what we're talking about tonight. I've never actually been to Kansas and I live within probably an hour and a half of the border. And I think there's like a Dairy Queen or Wendy's just on the other side. So I keep telling my wife, we need to just go to Kansas for lunch so we can say we've been there. But maybe that the going to see <laughs> the uh, capsule will be a better, uh, a more exciting trip. There's, there's definitely more, I, you know, another little sidebar. I went to space camp when I, there, when I was in sixth grade. So, uh, got to spend some, some great time touring their exhibits. Uh, you know, when, the, when the museum was just completely open to us and we got to go beyond the velvet rope, so to speak, and uh. sit in some of the capsules that had actually been into space and all those kind of things. Apollo 13 wasn't there at the time, but, um, uh, that said, uh, 
what a wonderful place to visit out in the middle of nowhere. I think it's second only to the Smithsonian in terms of their space memorabilia and not fake space memorabilia, real stuff that's been into space that's now on display that you can see and interact with. Pretty cool. I think they've also got a an SR-71 on display now too that you can get underneath. That's uh, pretty I'll cool. I'll have to definitely go check it out. Maybe that'll be my next road trip. So uh, the uh, movie you were talking about, the Japanese woodworker where he had to sharpen his tools. I don't, I don't know if you're aware of Christopher Swartz, uh from Lost Art Press. He used to write for Popular Woodworking before he started his company, and now he writes books or republishes books. And uh, The Joiner and the Cabinet Maker is one of the books that he published. And it's basically about a young man that um, – goes through an apprenticeship very similar to what you described where he had to learn how to do all the sharpening and then he had to learn how to do all the like uh, board prep so he had to flatten all the boards before he had to pass it off to the master carpenter to do the joinery and uh, it's just a really good book so I just wanted to that was that was why I was looking around the the room that you thought I had to fly in here I couldn't remember <laughs> the name of the book but I remember it had a red cover it's been a while yeah. since I read it I'll have to check that one out. That sounds like a good read or, or if nothing else, um, well, I don't know. This lost art put things out on, uh, on audio books. If so, I'll, I'll cue that up the next time I've got a long drive. So the joiner and the cabinet maker. Yeah, I would yeah. definitely check that out, but yeah, back to, back to making it work. I think we've been talking about tools quite a bit. I think materials is another one that I find myself in the middle of all the time. And on, on the metalworking side of things, heat is your friend. Heat can turn any piece of metal into any other piece of metal, <laughs> depending on what you're trying to do. And um, it's, it's kind of amazing to me as I design things and think about things there's always a need for a custom fastener of some kind or some kind of pin with a, with a head on it that doesn't really exist in a catalog. And I would, I would tell you that's one place where I have really honed my skills or, or I, I don't know, skills is the right word, but honed my craft in understanding that you have to, you have to let the problem tell you what it wants rather than the other way around. And when you've got a catalog of fasteners, you're you're sort of pinned in by what you see in front of you. And when you flip that switch and understand that anything can become anything, then all of a sudden it's like, okay, what does the project need? You know, well, maybe it needs a pin with a, a cross pin, or maybe it needs a pin with a pinned over end, or maybe it needs a threaded piece with a, a dowel piece that allows a bearing to spin, or whatever it is. And I I now have CNC milling machines and things like that that allow me to do all kinds of cool stuff. But before before I had that, I did a lot of work with a, a tap and die set and hand grinders and files and a torch. And it's amazing with, with just that simple set of tools, you can make almost any kind of specialty fastener that you might need. Uh, obviously a lathe is a great tool to have, but I've never had a metal, I, I've never had a lathe of any kind. Um, but as, as we all know, our power drills can become lathes if we need them to be, uh, kind of the difficult way to do it. But if you have enough, um, uh, if you have enough time and put in enough effort, you can get the same quality of stuff with a power drill as you can with a lathe that just takes a little bit longer. Yeah. Before I had a lathe, I tried to use my drill press as a lathe. I will say that that drill press no longer drills straight. It, it uh, <laughs> s s bad things happen from the side load pressure, but uh, yep. yeah, I still was able to uh, at least get a taste of whether or not I wanted to get a lathe or not. But uh, on a side note to your fastener thing, that reminded me of a, a thing that just happened recently. I'm trying to find the right fastener or the right hinge for a particular project or the right whatever. Uh, we seem to have uh, um, everything at our fingertips with the internet. We can just look everything up on Google. But if you don't know what it's called, uh, you're you're stuck and like I was trying to find this specific hinge for the sideboard that I'm uh, building because the way I want the doors designed is the door can't have uh, a, a swing out into the 
area where you'd normally swing it out, like you put a, a filler strip in there so you have room for the door to go, it needs to just come out and turn 90. So I needed that specific hinge, but I didn't know what it was called. So it took me a while to find it, and uh, Bloom Hardware makes it, or Blum Hardware makes it, and there's also another company called Heffel, I think it's called, or Haffel? Haffela. Haffela, yes. Yeah. So I, and I, I found them by accident just in my Google searching, and I called the lady, or I called their customer service line to ask if they could send me a catalog, if they had a printed catalog, because I, if I don't know what it, they all is, and she's like, so which catalog do you want? And I was like, well, I'm a custom guy, so I make everything. So if I just have your complete catalog, it would be great. And so a couple of days go by, and I get this box that's like a moving <laughs> a box. Crate. Yeah, th and there's like 15 catalogs in this thing. That, that's like the most extensive stuff ever. So now I feel like, okay, I have the catalogs of all catalogs for everything I need to build as long as they keep making it. Yeah, there's... There's always been three catalogs that have been in my mind, maybe not the must haves, but you should have, you should have a copy of each of them at some point in your life. Um, and, and one of them's kind of gone downhill a little bit, the Granger catalog that I don't even know if they print anymore, but when they used to print the Granger yeah. catalog, I have um, an old one in my office somewhere here, just fascinating amounts of, of motors and shivs and pulleys and hardware to make them all go. Uh, uh, it feels like pumps and valves and anything industrial the Granger catalog has. Fastenal is the second one. And at one point in time, Fastenal was just fasteners and they very rarely got outside of that. And their catalog was literally every, every style of fastener head, every length, every thread, every everything, you know, from shoulder bolts or stripper bolts to sex bolts to, uh, you know, just straight, straight bolts, screws, whatever. That was always a wonderful resource because again, if you don't know that a socket head cap screw is called a socket head cap screw or a socket head button screw is also in the cap screw category, but not the same as a, a socket head cap screw. Like you don't know where all these things fall and it's hard to say what they are. That catalog was great. And then the third catalog, which has become sort of the granddaddy now. I think it, it probably gets a little more FaceTime than it used to is the McMaster car catalog. And again, they bridge such a broad spectrum of industrial pieces and parts. But those three catalogs can put together almost any hardware thing that you may ever need. Anyway. Yeah, I wonder if the McMaster car i know you watch adam savage from time to time on mm -hmm. his youtube channel and he talks about this catalog that like you can't really just like order it or get it that that you have to buy a certain amount of stuff and then they'll send it to you i'm wondering if that was the mcmaster car that's catalog a, he was talking about or if there's another one out there it's it's become that it's become almost a cult thing like i see people on instagram put pictures of their mcmaster car catalog like i got one and Back in the day, it was never really that big of a deal to get one. I think the the fact that we just don't print everything anymore is the reason they've become a little more scarce. Yeah. I don't know if they have a threshold for it anymore. I don't have their catalog. I find their online catalog is so visual. Uh, they probably do, of all the different places I shop for odd things, which I feel like I'm always in search of odd things from the manufacturing side. I need a doodad that's this big that does that, you know, instead of trying to make them all myself. Their, their online catalog is very visual and you're able to sort of drill down through, through their visual menus into the precise things that you need. Um, you know, it goes from, from pins to pins with releases to, you know, just I, I i can't even begin to to talk about all the iterations of things even even washers you know so okay we'll start with a it's a circular washer it's a thick circular washer it's a thick circular washer that is antimicrobial that's made of rubber that's made you know and you just keep drilling down through these these wonderful menus and then the fact that uh fusion 360 wrote an interface for it so early in their programming and you can literally grab a model of anything from the McMaster car catalog. It's like, 
why would I want the paper one anymore? But I digress. Um, it, it definitely has become sort of a, an underground group that, that brags about having them. I think Tom Sachs was one of the first people. I don't know if you know Tom. He's an artist in New York. Um, one of the first people to start really bragging about it. And then, you know, there there was a whole line of, of folks. Uh, I don't want to say bad things, but maybe who were riding coattails a little bit that would do the same thing and brag about their McMaster car catalog. It's like, well, <laughs> all right. Yeah, and that's... Adam's great. Don't get me wrong. I love Adam to death. I think I think his his stuff is is uh, high class and awesome. I watch everything he does, and and he is definitely worthy of owning <laughs> the McMaster car catalog. Yeah, he has earned that right for sure. Yeah, there's an unfortunate thing in the and just the world in general. I've seen it not just in maker communities groups on Facebook, but other hobbies that I'm interested in, and that there's like the ability to flex on someone. Like, look That's at me. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think Adam Savage, when he was showing off his catalog, was flexing. I think he was true, genuinely excited that he got one, like, or that he had one. But some people, like, really pushed to, to their, just to show off their flex there. Yeah. Look at my new thing. I think he's about as humble a guy as I've I've ever seen. I've never met Adam in, in person, but uh, ever seen on the internet and in his abilities. He He has a level of humility that I think sometimes he understates the amount of talent that he has that guy is supremely talented right and... he's, he says his brand is screwing up and it's just like well that's how you learn to not not screw up you know but... yeah i think and and again not to get too far off topic but i i think it's a very similar thing right he his his channel he talks about the additions that he makes to his workshop and the tools that he has and uh you know in recent time he upgraded his mill uh, to a, a knee mill. I think it's a, I think it's a Bridgeport style and not an Excello style, which kind of surprised me a little bit, but it, it's common. Um, but he talked about how that tool would make him such a better, you know, have better abilities in the machine area. And maybe it will uh, give him an ability to hold tolerance uh, maybe easier than he could in the past. But Adam has the type of grit that you need to make the tool that you have work. And I think that's where he was for a very long time is just, Hey, I'm going to make this work. And now he's got a tool that really helps him excel in terms of time. And I think that's the big difference, um, you know, from the tool side of things, you don't need the tool to do the job, but sometimes you need the tool to do, do the job quickly. Uh, a, a good tool can help you get through some of the stumbling points where you might mess up a piece or two, but at the end of the day, uh, it's a, it's a poor carpenter that blames his tools. Right. And uh, yeah, we'll say that. Well, I did want to shift a little bit too and talk about materials. Um, I've, I've got so many things um, in my daily life that were made from the dregs and I spend not a lot of time, but an, more than most, probably, I spend time in scrapyards looking through piles of stuff, sometimes for inspiration, sometimes because I'm looking for a thing that's shaped like another thing. And the easiest way to find that's in the scrapyard. And I think that that type of resourcefulness aids us when we have to make it work and we don't have all the right stuff. Um, I mean, I'm thinking in particular I've got a video on on YouTube about making my shop stool and I did this uh, you know when I when I see it in my shop I'm like that thing looks beautiful and it was all made out of scrap wood you know it's a, a little bit of mahogany and a little bit of maple and a little bit of something else I can't remember all the different woods that are in there but it was literally out of necessity I needed this shop bench or shop stool and uh I had this pile of weird lumber <laughs> And, you know, you, you slowly send it over the joiner and through the planer and get it square and parallel and all those kind of things. And then, you know, start rearranging pieces to see what's pleasing to the eye. And sometimes that challenge actually produces a better piece than if I would have just had, uh, you know, one big solid chunk of fill in the blank mahogany or hard maple or uh, something like that. And it makes for some really interesting projects when you just have to make it work. Yeah, a few years ago, I built an oval table and uh, had these little sculpted legs. 
uh, and there was, there was four legs, and I was cutting off four legs, and I, I don't remember what happened, but for some reason I moved the stop on my table saw and forgot to cut the uh, a fourth leg. So I somehow I got interrupted. I don't remember. This was quite a few years ago. And so I was like, oh, I go to start to cut the joinery, and I'm like, oh, I forgot to cut the fourth leg to length. And I went back to the table saw, flipped the stop down, which was now in a different spot, and I cut it. And so now <laughs> it's too short. And I was like, what do I do? And uh, this is like... Um, going to be in a gallery show that weekend and I didn't have time to go buy another board because it's like 10 o'clock at night, right? So I just needed to figure out how I'm going to make this work so I can get it glued up so I can get some finish on it the next day. So this oval table has three tiers to it. So the top tier now is held up um, uh, by the three legs. And then the bottom two tiers are held up by the third leg that's shorter and that that where the fourth leg would have been is just cantilevered and the design turned out way better because yeah. of that mistake because i had to figure out how to make it work than if i would have had it done in four tables and um when i took it to the gallery show it like it sold like that because everyone was like holy crap that's really cool how that's cantilevered over there like that so uh, making it work kind of, uh, I think, is what sold the, sold the piece. I think as, as a designer uh, on the architectural side, I say this to people all the time, that sometimes the constraints actually make for a better project because they force you out of your comfort zone. If you just have a frictionless plane and everything is square and true to the world, it, it makes for very boring pieces. Uh, I'm even looking at the pieces of lumber that you have on the wall behind you. If you start with something like that, there's a lot more inspiration that can happen out of a piece like that that can cause you to make a different move because you are using this piece that can't that doesn't fit the mold. Maybe it's got a big knot or a big void or something where you would have you know normally shaped this classical Queen Anne leg or you know fill in the blank, and all of a sudden. Since your materials don't support that very straightforward copycat design, now you're forced to do something different and innovative and make that work. I've I've got a guitar that I want to grab off the wall that I want to I want to talk about this. Give me two seconds. Here, okay. okay. This was a um, what do I want to call him? Um, internet acquaintances. There we go. Um, somebody that I talked to early in his career uh, had very few subscribers on YouTube named Ben Crow, and he has a channel called Crimson Guitars. He has a business called Crimson Guitars. Very successful guitar maker out of the UK. Uh, phenomenal. Uh, he, he supports what he calls the Great Guitar Build-Off every year, and hundreds of people enter this Great Guitar Build-Off and build guitars and do videos. Really inspirational inside of the guitar community. But um, I started watching Ben when he was in his in his garden shed out behind his house, tiny little shop, doing a lot of stuff with hand tools. And he wound up buying a, a bigger shop and a building and expanding and doing a bunch of things. And he did a Kickstarter to uh, fund a CNC machine and some other things that he needed to make his business grow. And this was a guitar that was made out of a kit that he was selling on the Kickstarter. And um, so I can't remember what this is, English uh, English Elm or, or uh, English Ash maybe. Um, but the body you can see is carved. And um, when, when I got the kit, this was not intended to be a carved top guitar and I started carving it and I blew through the uh, output jack hole. <laughs> <laughs> that he had put in the kit and that became an opportunity to do a little insert and make a, a nice detail. Uh, so that's just basically a walnut dowel with a hole drilled through it. Um, and, and it was one of those make it work moments. And I knew I was going to cut through that hole because, you know, you start planning out where you're going to make your cuts and it's like, yeah, that's not, not going to happen. But it was one of those make it work moments. And I knew I wanted this to be a carved top and well, that was the way to do it that I thought would look the best. And it came out as this, as this really interesting feature that none of these other carved top guitars have. So 
Yeah, that's kind of fun. really cool. So for the uh, the audio listeners that aren't watching the video version of this, we do have a video version on YouTube if you want to look at what he's saying. But to kind of describe that, that's where the uh, the cord plugs in for the electric guitar to go to the amp, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So yep. this this cord, instead of just going straight into the uh, the body of the guitar and disappearing like you normally would, it kind of goes in at an angle. So from the lighting, it looks like it's a piece of ebony that's super polished up there. But you said that was walnut. Uh, I think it's walnut. It's either walnut or it's a uh, African mahogany that's very, very, very dark. Yeah, it's um, almost black in color. So it goes yeah. in and it kind of tapers away and disappears into the guitar. Uh, it's a really cool effect. So if you're listening to the audio version, I would definitely check out, or maybe you could send me a picture and I'll post it on our website. Yeah, I with can the episode. do that. Um, yeah, yeah, it's very cool. But again make it work type of moments and when you're when you're into a guitar for you know several hundred dollars and and you you know you come up on it's like well is this going to wreck my plans or or am i just going to shift and make this thing work somehow i think as designers and as makers that's that's our job is to to work with what you got to make it the best you can and uh you know sometimes Again, sometimes those constraints, I think, actually make for better designs. And um, it's interesting. Uh, I think some of us look at that and start to impose our own constraints because it inspires that creativity. Yeah, that's. I think we talked about it maybe in episode one, that the thing that uh, I hate and are excited about the most is when a client says, says, ah, oh, you have free reign to do whatever you want. And I th always thought, well, oh, that was really cool. I could do whatever I want. And then I sit down and it's like, well, I don't have a direction to go. So yeah, having, having a constraint is very important. And I think that example of uh, the guitar thing is opens up a whole nother potential conversation on this subject of hiding your mistakes. Like you make a mistake yeah. and it's like, okay, so how am I going to hide this mistake or what I'm, what am I going to do? Like if there's a, a gouge in the wood, can I put covered up with a bow tie or a Dutchman or make that a feature and do some kind of inlay in there or something along those lines? Yeah. I often wonder, you know, where, where the origins of some of the techniques in woodwork and metalwork and uh, other types of crafts come from. And, and you always wonder, you know, when, when you see marquetry and some of that stuff, did that come about because there were knots in the middle of pieces and somebody said, you know what, I'd rather put a butterfly here. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about a, a literal picture of a butterfly it, instead of having this knot here. And then, you know, from there it grows into how else can we cover these things up and, and make something that's, I mean, can you imagine uh, 200 years ago, the tools that they were using to produce some of the art that you see in museums, um, how long it would have taken to get to a point, and then all of a sudden you uncover a sap pocket in the middle of your in the middle of the piece of wood you've been working on for the last three months with you know very very primitive tools and you know the reaction to that like how can how can I cover that up? How can I make that into a feature rather than a bug? So we, we've talked a little bit about tools. We've talked a little bit about materials and making those things work. When it comes to finishes, that's probably a totally different category that as you approach the finish to a project, I feel like there's a lot less improvisation that you're capable of doing because you get into chemistry, uh, you, you get into surface finish and everything else. And it's definitely, it's nothing to be cavalier about. Although you can be creative with finishes, I feel like that's a part where you really do have to execute well and you have to you have to do things a little bit more by the book. It's it's baking versus cooking, right? Yeah, cooking you can just throw a little bit of spice here, a little bit of spice there, but baking you have to be very precise or that bread may not ever rise. Um and I think we should also make a kind of a delineation between uh, staining a project and finishing a project because oh, yeah. staining is kind of an art in itself and it can be used not just to color the entire piece of uh, your entire project like you're building a dresser and you want to stain it kind of a golden oak uh, which I hope dies someday that it's <laughs> never manufactured again 
<laughs> but let's just say you wanted to stain it a golden oak, so you stain your entire piece of golden oak. But it doesn't have uh, to be that that way. I use a lot of times dyes when I do bow tie inlays in a crack. Like maybe I'll intentionally carve the crack wider or carve a crack altogether just to give the illusion that there's a crack in the wood to put bow ties in. And to help sell that illusion, I'll use some dark brown stain and stain the uh, inside of my carving to to dirty it up a little bit. But then when you get into finishing, I, I, yeah, I think uh, finishing is something you either get it right or, or you get it wrong. And there's a huge amount of practice to get a good finish. And that's kind of the first thing that the client uh, runs their hand across when you, when I bring a piece out, the first thing they do is run their hand across the top of the, the desk or the bench or table or whatever I've built to feel how smooth the finish is. And so if, if you don't nail the finish, it's they're they're going to be less impressed with your work. There's so not we really. Can, yeah, we can. Not, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Brian. That's my last thing. You're you're not going to be able to really hide that or just make it work, right? You're you're either sanding it back or and reapplying, or you're like, yeah, it, it's it's supposed to be a a rough rustic finish. Yeah, I was going to say the the make it work part of finishing is if it's not right, you make it work by sanding it off and doing it again. <laughs> Although I would say, uh, interestingly enough, in the automotive finish arena, and that's where I'm most familiar is your acrylic, uh, acrylic enamels, acrylic lacquers, and acrylic urethanes that are, you know, two part, very dangerous. <laughs> you want the right breathing apparatus type of type of products. They're not just generally over the counter. You have to you have to know what you're doing when you're working with those things. I've found that it's amazing how much build you can get out of some of those finishes. Again, prep is everything. There's no way I would ever spray a finish over something that was marginal in terms of prep. Like you learn your lesson the first time you screw that up to never do it again. And, but when you're putting the finish on uh, famously on my Carmen Ghia, when I was painting it, um, the last thing that I put clear on, the very last piece of that car that I put clear on was the hood. And I literally spent from, I think it was somewhere around uh, 5.30 a.m. in the morning. I was done painting that car at something like 10 p.m. At the, in the evening. It was, it was like, a, I remember it being about a 17-hour day. It was just brutal. It was hot. It was in the 90s. Uh, sweat all day, just down in Gatorade. And the last piece I put clear on about three or four coats of clear, something like that. A spider came down right in the middle of the hood as I had just finished the last coat of clear. Now, um, the interesting thing is with, with some of those automotive type finishes is the build is so high, you can actually sand out those imperfections and fix a lot of the problems and make mistakes work. Um, I also dipped my elbow in the clear on the fender and i had a big run a big sag down uh, the driver's side fender that i wound up scraping off with a razor blade and leveling out and polishing and uh was able to make it work you can't tell where it was and so so there are i i feel like there is a little bit of latitude in some finishes that you can you can put enough build on there to to pull back off some things and and buff them out but i think you're absolutely right if you're i've always treated finishing I, i've always thought mentally of it as surgery like if you're going in to cut somebody open and replace a heart valve you want to be very meticulous <laughs> and and my finishing uh i have a routine the first thing i do is stuff a paper towel in my back pocket because something's going to go wrong you could spill something you could drop something, you could whatever. And if you if you don't have that paper towel in your back pocket to respond in a heartbeat, you might lose that piece or you might be in for a, you know what, call it a day, let it dry and we're going to sand it back off. Um, and then everything's, you. I'm sure you're this way, everything's rubber gloves and you start tacking things off and, you know, you've you've really got to be in that surgery mentality when you're finishing something. Yeah, one thing that I've learned the hard way is once something starts to tack up and you're looking it over and you see a blemish, don't touch it, just let it dry. Because 
it'll be way easier to sand that little blemish out once it's 100 percent dry and then shoot another clear coat over the top of it than it is whatever you're going to touch it with because it will f that spot up no matter what you you think oh it's just a little hair i'm going to take the the very tip of my pocket knife and pop that little hair out no once you do that it's just going to make this big huge line and it's going to be nasty and the edge of the knife is going to touch something that you didn't want it to touch because your hand shook a little and it's just all over every every single time i thought oh i could i could just touch it up a little bit before it's dry just turn into a mess absolute train wreck (laughs) <laughs> and I'm I'm certain you've done this because I think we all have. You you have a pair of tweezers or something, and you pull. Uh, sometimes it's a brush hair. Sometimes it's a human hair. I don't know how the hell human hair floats around in a shop and lands in the middle of a panel. Like I don't have hair, and somehow hair lands in the middle of my pieces <laughs> all the time. And if you take the <laughs> a pair of tweezers and pull that hair out. It leaves a dent in your finish and you can put 20 more coats of finish on there. And it's, it's like kryptonite that dent will just push the paint away and it will just get worse instead of better. Yeah. It'd have been better if you just left it there and then sanded the hair away. Yes. (laughs) I, I, I still don't know what, how, how it re how something like that, an imperfection in the surface tension of a finish repels finish from there forward it's it's like it's reverse magnetic i I don't know how to explain that (laughs) but yes definitely in the in the make it work uh arena leave it alone (laughs) stop touching it and deal with it later yes i had a a good friend again in the middle of a paint job uh something had gone wrong and uh um i'm trying to think what it was uh it was a drip from my gun so um, spray guns, HVLP guns have a cap that you screw on. And then there's usually a little breather hole there. And if you're painting the bottom side of a rocker panel or something, your, your gun goes upside down for just a brief moment in time. And that brief moment in time is just enough to get a drop of paint out of the cup and onto the top. And later as you're spraying the car, that drip will work its way down and into the finish somehow. And I had done that uh dropped a drop something in the finish and i can't remember exactly what it was but i i literally called a good friend of mine who's a, a hot rod painter he paints the half million dollar cars you know he does the really expensive paint jobs and i said jeff um i've got a problem <laughs> i'm i'm into you know like a, a coat and a half into into a paint job here and you you got to remember you might be spending a thousand dollars on color so it's expensive, the mistake that you're about to make. And uh, and I told him, I said, I've got an imperfection in the paint. And I can see it. It's right. It's right outside the driver's, you know, the driver's side on the fender. I'll be able to see it every time I jump in this car. <laughs> like it's going to be the bane of my existence. And he said, I'll tell you what, Greg, why don't you, uh, why don't you just put your paint gun down and go inside and grab a drink and have some lunch and let it dry. And then you can come out. And uh, um, at the time I had, uh, um, gosh, what, what's it called? It's a, it's a surface prep uh, type of type of solvent. So you, it's the last thing you go over the car with to get off all your fingerprint oil and that sort of thing. And he said, just squirt a little bit of that on there. Use some 800 grit paper once it's dry and sand it out. And then you can repaint that area and do another coat on the car and nobody will ever know it was there. And he was absolutely right. The best advice I ever got was to just walk away and let it dry, have some lunch, have a drink, and then come back to it. Because if you stand there, you'll touch it and you keep screwing with it. And you'll just make the whole paint job bad. So anyway, good fun. Yeah. So a uh, fun tip about that little hole at the top. I have uh, finished slop up, slosh up into that hole all the time. And the finish I use dries really, really fast. It has a a kicker in it, so it sets off really fast. And that stupid little hole has made me lose my mind multiple times, not just from drips, but when it dries, it plugs that hole and it's a gravity fed gun. So it's like putting the finger over the straw. And now all of a sudden I'm getting half, half atomization or only half a fan because that hole's plugged and there's not, it's starving the gun to finish. 
Well, so. I can tell you that experience, Brian, um, taught me to just take a piece of two inch tape and I put it around the front rim of my cap and it sticks up over the top of the cap. So when I have that drip come forward, it just runs into the tape and stops. Um, but yes, I always, that's another thing I have. I, I have a handful of things. I have a paper towel in my back pocket. I have a pair of tweezers because every once in a while you get something that you do have to pick out and, and you have to, you have to, you have to decide. If it's big, you got to get rid of it. Yeah. If it's a spider, you probably need to pull it out. Um, and then uh, I have a toothpick and that toothpick is because it doesn't matter. You're going to have some small hole somewhere that needs attention in some way, shape or form, whether that's on your gun. Uh, I don't know whether you, you, get something in your eye or you have to pick something off of a glove or, or something like that. You, you wind up that toothpick will save your bacon more times than not. So just little, little fun tricks that I've learned over the years that those, those handful of little tools in your back pocket will save you massive amounts of frustration. And of course uh, I'm talking about painting things that are car size. When I'm painting things that are guitar size, it's a lot different. I, I just have a, Usually I just have a paper towel in my back pocket. And again, on a guitar, it's, it's so easy to just stop right now, walk away and come back and paint it again tomorrow, where once you get moving forward on a car paint job, you pretty much kind of want to finish it right there. You're kind of committed. Yeah. To something like that. You are. You, like I said, you know, you start, you start uh, reducing a thousand dollars worth of paint and you really don't want to let it sit very long. You can, but you don't want, you don't want to. Yeah. I think the key to not screwing up a finish is being prepared and having your, your work area organized. Like I'll have, uh, I'll have my thinner and a little bit of uh, another cup with some, uh, um, I use a uh, butyl acetate sometimes to clean the gun because when you get in that, when you're in the middle of a spray gun and you get a plug in the gun, uh, instead of breaking the entire gun down, butyl acetate is so strong, it'll peel anything out of that gun you need. And you can get right back to pour the finish back in with a new strainer, of course, and then uh, back going. But yeah, <clears throat> having it all organized and laid out, ready to go can uh, help keep your finished project moving on without catastrophe. Well, and one point for people who aren't, who aren't experienced at finishing things, um, you always want to set your finished table up away from your project. And I say it four or five steps away, because if you accidentally tip over a quart cup of finish and it hits the floor, it splashes a long way. <laughs> and the last thing you want, when you tip over a cup of finish and, you know, there might be a couple hundred dollars worth of stuff in there, you're going to be really pissed because you lost that. The last thing you want to do is also screw up the project that you just spent the last 40 hours prep sanding on. So if you can separate those two things from one another, you can keep a bad day from getting worse. Yeah, for sure. So I have uh, two, two uh, thoughts that kind of came to mind while we were talking. Uh, one, I don't know if you watch a blacksmith on YouTube called Alex Steele. I know Alex Steele. I know who he is. Yes. Okay. So I've watched him from when he was just starting out his YouTube uh, journey and he didn't have a whole ton of tools and he's even moved from the UK to um, Montana, right? Montana. Yeah. And then he reset up a shop during COVID so he could go back to his family back in the UK um, and just set up like a makeshift shop. And so he's definitely someone that I've seen go from very little tools to a fully outfitted workshop. And uh, he's uh, definitely a guy that, that has made it work with what he's got. And people have uh, made fun of him in the comments of his uh, YouTube channel for some of his methods of how he gets things solved or fixed or moves the project forward. And so he has a shirt that, uh, a t-shirt that says if um uh it's not stupid if it works yeah. so uh, i thought that was a pretty good uh t-shirt if you ever want to uh get something along the lines of make it work with what you got that would be a good way to go i've always liked his his t-shirt that says less yak yak more whack whack <laughs> yeah that's another good one <laughs> yeah for sure 
And but, then uh, my last my last thought is uh, last weekend I went down to uh, a national park called Mesa Verde. Uh, it's in southern Colorado. It's the cliff uh, cliff uh, cliff dwellings by the Pueblo Indians, and it's basically these ancient ruins um, of these cities that they built into the cliffs, um, and they had no power tools or anything. Power wasn't even a thing back then, um, and they had just had to make tools out of sticks or rock or whatever. And they built these massive cities, uh, just the materials they had around them. That was really fascinating. So if you're ever in Southern Colorado, I highly recommend visiting the cliff dwellings, but uh, bring your hiking shoes. Cause some of them, you have to climb down ladders and down steep hills to get into. I've seen pictures of that Mesa Verde area and it, it's always been on my list of places I need to go see. I need to do that. Fascinating stuff. But I I think that speaks volumes. You know, if you ever, uh, you know, Google the word bushcraft, that's what it's all about, making it work with what you have. You know, how do you trudge into a forest, you know, a couple miles, and then all of a sudden everything that you need to have should be there. And uh, kind of fascinating to see people who are really good at bushcraft, what they're capable of doing with almost nothing. Yeah, for sure. So uh, should we start to wrap this one up tonight? Yeah, I think we're about an hour in, so that'd probably be a good wrap point, Brian. Well, thanks for joining us on our podcast today. I'm Greg Porter, and my YouTube is Greg's Garage, and I also have another YouTube that is Skyscraper Guitars. And I'm Brian Benham, and you can find me at brianbenham.com, and that will give you all the links to all my YouTube and social stuff. And, of course, this is the Maker's Quest podcast, so you can uh, Google the Maker's Quest podcast, and that will take you to our website that will have all those links there for you. Thanks for listening.